Have you ever been worshipped? I'm not talking about that bring offerings to an altar built in your name kind of worship. Although if you do happen to have offerings of chocolate, my altar looks a lot like a staff <laughs> mailbox, second row from the top. <laughs> but I'm talking about the core meaning of the word worship looking into its origins and its deeper implications. When I ask you if you've ever been worshipped, I'm wondering if you have ever experienced anyone hold you and your life in awe. I'm curious if you have ever had someone recognize and respect your inherent worthiness, ascribed worth to the fullness of your being. Have you ever been worshipped? One of my favorite examples of this kind of worship comes from a joyously unexpected place, the movie Magic Mike XXL. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. For those among us who don't know much about this movie, it's a story about five male entertainers or strippers on a road trip for one last major hurrah at an annual stripper convention. In the last scene of the film, when our main characters are about to take the stage, their MC, who is played by the fabulous Jada Pinkett Smith, she asks the crowd of women if they are ready to be worshiped. What then takes place is a kind of worship that feminist writer Roxanne Gay describes as causing moviegoers to throw actual dollar bills at the screen. <laughs> it was raunchy, it was risque, it was filled with fantasies of all kinds. And it really was a beautiful moment of worship. Because throughout the scene, it wasn't just one kind of woman who was validated in her beauty or her sexuality. As each character performed his act, we saw consenting women of various body shapes, various skin colors, various ages, all being treated as attractive, as sensual, and yes, as sexual beings. Throughout the scene, we saw women with many, though not admittedly all, kinds of bodies being held up as worthy of physical intimacy and love, as attractive and beautiful. And the effects of that worship were made immediately clear after I saw that movie with my friend this summer. As we began making our way out of the theater, we found ourselves behind a couple of women, one who looked to be in her 40s and one who looked somewhat older, maybe in her 70s. As we followed them down the steps, the older of these two women turned to us, grinned and said without any hesitation, I need to find myself a younger man. <laughs> The exchange was made ever more perfect by the young 20-something theater employee whose eyes went wide with shock <laughs> when he heard this. And that moment, I saw the affirming effects of worship. After seeing the many kinds of women being worshipped on that screen, this woman was confident and affirmed enough to turn to random strangers and declare that she herself was worthy of that kind of worship. And she was excited to let others know that truth. Now, to be fair, I don't actually know much about her story or her personality. What I saw might have actually been her typical understanding of her relationships. <laughs> But regardless of whether this film confirmed her pre-existing inclinations or gave her an opportunity to adopt a whole new attitude, in that moment she knew her worth and that knowledge gave her a sense of joy that she could not resist sharing with others. So looking again at the content of Magic Mike, Part of what makes it more than a film about those five male entertainers on a road trip 
is its prophetic message about the limited definition of what we call physically beautiful in our society. In its affirmation of the beauty and worthiness of a range of women's physical forms, it challenges the exclusionary features that are so often required to be considered a person of beauty. In its worship of this wider than traditionally accepted range of women's bodies, the film Magic Mike ascribes worth or sees the beauty of what has so often been called ugly. It sends the message, you don't have to try. And that message contradicts the way many of the physical characteristics of what we might call ugly are treated in our typical discourse. Rather than see them as features worthy of worship, we are too often taught that we need to change or eradicate them. We are sold makeup to hide acne scars and wrinkles. We use control top pantyhose to get that perfect butt and thighs. We color the gray in our hair. We cycle through the newest diet and exercise fad every month thinking, maybe this time this will get rid of my gut. Our culture is constantly reminding us that to be worthy of the label beautiful, we have to get rid of everything that is not part of a very specific and largely unrealistic, idolized form. And when we say something is ugly in our society, what else are we connecting to those physical characteristics? When we call something ugly, what are we saying we believe about its nature, about how we should interact with it? Something that is ugly is unattractive. It is unpleasant. It is repugnant. Something that we call ugly is repulsive, nasty, appalling, shameful, objectionable, vile, even frightful. When we call something ugly, we are saying it is less than. We are saying it's not worthy of love. And that's how we're constantly approaching what we have been conditioned to see as physically ugly. So what does that mean for all that we have been conditioned to see as socially or culturally ugly? What does it mean for people and characteristics that have been we have been conditioned to see as unpleasant, not just in our sight, but in our minds? repulsive and shameful to our spirits, objectionable or frightful in our hearts. What else are we saying is not worthy of our love, of our worship? What has been deemed ugly in our society is unfortunately not limited to body images. Much of the marginalization the hatred, the violence inflicted on certain people and communities are the result of being judged and treated as ugly. In the example of racism, black and brown lives have been historically portrayed and treated as ugly, as less good and less worthy than white lives. From narratives of savagery towards the indigenous people of this land, to narratives of inferiority, justifying the forced enslavement of Africans in the European colonies, people of color have long been presented as ugly in the US cultural narrative. And this portrayal of ugliness has been a perpetual one, finding new ways to infiltrate our hearts, our minds, and our social structures. What we call our criminal justice system, our immigration laws, our national security, they all contain elements of which are meant to call people ugly. Narratives surrounding gender identity also carry their own ideas around what has been deemed culturally ugly or objectionable. This month, residents in the city of Houston 
voted to overturn HERO, the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance, an anti-discrimination measure that made it illegal to discriminate against anyone on the basis of race, disability status, sexual orientation, and gender identity. But what happened in Houston with the repeal of HERO was ugly. In their efforts to have these protections removed, several conservative religious leaders began a fear-mongering campaign that centered on and vilified the transgender community. They turned a law protecting employment and housing rights into a myth about bathrooms, arguing that protections for gender identity would allow men to enter women's restrooms and assault young girls. This campaign was vitriolic and disgusting to say the least, and its disturbing success by a margin, a large margin, showed just how readily parts of our society are willing to label certain communities as ugly. And the Transgender Day of Remembrance reminds us that when this treatment of people and communities as ugly or less than goes unchallenged, the consequences are devastatingly fatal. The failure to challenge the dehumanization and treatment as ugly of trans lives in our society, like our failure to affirm the beauty and worth of people of color, comes with tragically irreversible consequences. Irreversible, but not preventable. But preventable. Because we know that the narratives around what is seen as worthy and beautiful, what is seen as less than and ugly, can and have to change. And if we wish to live into that affirmation of that first Unitarian Universalist principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, we have to commit ourselves to affirming the beauty and worth of people whose worth and beauty has for too long been denied. And thankfully, that work, that effort is happening. Today, there are numerous movements by people on the margins who have been treated as ugly to proclaim their beauty and challenge the attitudes and structures that say they are anything less than beautiful. These are movements of self-love, assertions of worthiness and power that are being led by the very people who have been denied their right to be worshipped to have their lives held in awe. In the area of body image, particularly for women, there is a growing effort to affirm the, the beauty of all body sizes, shapes, and colors. God has love handles. God is balding. God uses a walker, a hearing aid, has rich, dark chocolate skin. Within racial justice, we see the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. In the words of its organizers, Black Lives Matter is an affirmation of black folks' contribution to this society, our humanity, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. And despite the heartbreaking outcome of the hero vote in Houston, there have been many successes in the movements to affirm the beauty and worth of trans lives. 20 states, the most recent of which was the state I just left, New York, have laws on the book that explicitly protect transgender people from discrimination. And last month, California became the first state to grant access to gender-affirming medical care to people in prisons. So how are we? as individuals and as a community called to love what has too long been called ugly. Some of us may hold those identities or be part of those communities that continue to bear the status of ugly in our society. Loving what has been called ugly in your life may very much be an act of self-love, a breaking down of the cage of lies that have told you you are not beautiful or powerful or worthy of worship. 
Loving ugly may largely be an act of resistance to cultural narratives around your worth through the celebration of your own beauty. For all of us, and especially those of us who hold identities that have historically held the privilege of being affirmed as beautiful, loving ugly is an active process. It is much more than simply believing that all people possess an inherent worth and sacred beauty that should never be denied, although that is an essential part of the process. But feeling or thinking this truth, that so much of what has been called ugly should be affirmed as beautiful, it's not the same thing as acting upon it. To love ugly is to engage in the act of transformation. To love what has been called ugly is to commit ourselves to ensuring the well-being and affirmation of another's worth. It is to take the risk of naming the beauty and worth of what has been called ugly in the public sphere, knowing there will likely be resistance. It is to lovingly challenge the assumptions of ugliness embedded in the minds and hearts of those closest to us, knowing that the cost to our relationships is less than the cost to the lives that have been deemed less than worthy if we remain silent. And it is also a willingness to be transformed ourselves. It is a willingness to let our relationships with the people who have been called ugly and less worthy change how our minds and hearts understand the world. Loving ugly means we build into our lives regular interactions and relationships of accountability that ensure we are indeed listening to the proclamations of self-worth being made by those ugly members of society. It means checking our actions to make sure they are in line with the needs and directions of the people whose worth we are seeking to affirm. Loving ugly means not necessarily being the ones to lead change, but becoming respectful and accountable accomplices in the work for universal justice. Loving ugly is a process of learning from the visions of those who have been called less worthy, less beautiful, and supporting their strategies for achieving affirmation and change. It is not so much about giving power to the marginalized in our society, but about seeing and following the power that they already have, the power and beauty that nobody else has been willing to recognize. And it's our universalism, the word every, in that first principle that we all know and have memorized for our UU elevator speeches that calls us to love ugly. Our universalism is what calls us to challenge those oppressive lies that beauty has a particular form. That worth is scarce and we must be in competition with one another to be recognized as powerful human beings. Our universalism is what challenges the destructive narratives that claim that our sacred love that created us and creates with us does not have the capacity to affirm all of us. Our universal understanding of salvation, of our liberation, it teaches us that we are necessarily intertwined and it reminds us that we have the capacity and responsibility to speak truths, truths that save individual lives and transform whole worlds. Our universalism reminds us that every person is worthy of being worshipped.